No worries. So hi, everyone. Today we have our very own Yiplan as our speaker. Uh, he's a PhD at CMU. Today he's going to talk about his work, Malaysia Security Comes Free in Honest Majority Multi-Party Computation. Let's welcome him. OK. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yifan Sang. Today, I'm happy to give a talk about secure multi-party computation with honest majority. Please feel free to stop me for any question or clarification. Consider the scenario where there are several parties who want to compute a common function on their private inputs. This may be the case that each party holds a private data set and all parties want to train a machine learning model over the joint data set. However, the data may contain sensitive information due to the privacy issue. Each party may not be willing to reveal the data to the public. Ideally, we may hope that there is a trusted third party so that she can collect all the data from other parties, compute the function outputs, and distribute the results to other parties. In cryptography, such a trusted third party is referred to as an ideal functionality. Unfortunately, in the real world, such a trusted third party may not always be available. Secure multi-party computation is a protocol that all parties participate to emulate such an ideal functionality. The protocol describes how each party should interact with others. The pro it, um, it guarantees that the protocol execution does not leak anything about the individual inputs beyond what can be inferred from the function output, just as it is computed by a trusted third party. Usually, the function we want to compute is represented by a circuit, and here, and here we choose to use an arithmetic circuit over a finite field. The, the circuit supports addition and multiplication operations, if the field is a binary field, then an addition gate corresponds to an XOR gate, and a multiplication gate corresponds to an AND gate. We can use these two kinds of gates to represent all computable functions. As we will see later, the reason of using circuits to represent functions is to reduce the task of constructing protocols to, to computing addition and multiplication operations. In the setting of secure multi-party computation, an adversary can corrupt a set of parties which are denoted by corrupted parties. The goal of the adversary is to learn extra information about the inputs of other parties. There are three main dimensions to measure the ability of an adversary. The first dimension is semi-only security versus fully malicious security. In the semi-only security, an adversary we will always follow the protocol honestly, but try to learn extra information from the messages that corrupted parties receive. In the fully malicious setting, an adversary can arbitrarily deviate from the protocol by controlling the behaviors of corrupted parties. The second dimension is computational security versus unconditional security. This measures the computation power of an adversary. In the computational security, the computation power of an adversary is bounded by polynomial time, while in the unconditional security, the adversary has unlimited computation power. The third dimension is honest majority versus dishonest majority. This measures the number of parties that an adversary can corrupt. As the name suggests, in the honest majority setting, the number of, honest, number of corrupt parties is bounded by a half of all parties. In the dishonest majority setting, all but one parties can be corrupted. In this talk, we will consider both semi-honest security and fully malicious security. We will focus on the unconditional security with honest majority. We assume that there is a secure and authenticated private channel between every pair of parties so that they can communicate with, with each other and the messages will not be leaked to a third party. We will use N to denote the number of, the number of parties and T to denote the number of corrupted parties. In this graph, 
we have five parties, and two of them are corrupted. Note that in the unconditional security, the computation power of the adversary is unbounded. It means that we cannot rely on any cryptographic assumption since it is based on the hardness of the computation. Before we move on, I would like to motivate my talk by highlighting the following two points. First, why do we care about unconditional multi-party computation? A key feature of unconditional MPC is that we do not need any expensive cryptographic primitives such as public key encryption or obvious transfer, and the protocol is secure unconditionally. Comparing with protocols in the computational setting, one major benefit is that the protocol usually does not need any complicated and time-consuming local computations. As a result, the most efficient MPC protocols are in the unconditional MPC paradigm. Our goal is to minimize the communication complexity of the circuit of the protocol. Since the local computations are typically simple, often just a series of linear operations, the efficiency of a protocol in the real world is dominated by its communication complexity. Here is a comparison of recent constructions of communication efficient protocols in the AMIS majority setting. The efficiency of a protocol is measured by the number of field elements each party needs to send in order to compute a single gate. In the semi ami setting, the best known protocol is the DM protocol which requires to communicate six elements per party per gate. Recently, there are two works, CGH plus 18 and NV18, both achieving 12 elements per party per gate in the fully malicious setting. Our recent results co-authored with Weibo Goya and Chen Zhizhu closes, closes the gap of the communication complexity between the semi ami security and the fully malicious security. We obtained the first MPC protocol in the fully malicious setting where the communication complexity matches the best known DM protocol. We make a further improvement of the DM protocol, which allows us to reduce the cost from six elements to 5.5 elements. In this talk, we will first introduce the DM protocol and then show how our technique works to achieve the same communication, communication efficiency as the DM protocol. Here is an overview of our contribution. At a high level, we may transform from the semi ami security to the malicious security. A fully malicious adversary can not only lead the computation to a wrong result, but also break the secrecy of the underlying protocol. Interestingly, a previous work has shown that the semi ami scheme protocol has already provided the perfect secrecy, even if the adversary is fully malicious. Therefore, the main task becomes to check the correctness of the computation. The main contribution of, of our work is an efficient verification with sublinear communication complexity in the circuit, in, in the circuit size. Combining with the DM protocol, we can achieve malicious security with the same communication efficiency as the DM protocol. Most of communication efficient protocols are constructed based on secret sharing schemes. A secret sharing scheme allows the dealer to secret share a value S to our parties such that there is the threshold T, that is the number of corrupted parties. Any T shares are independent of the secrets, which means that the shares of corrupted parties are independent of the secret value S. And any T plus one shares can be used to reconstruct the secrets which means that the shares of honest parties can determine the secret value S. A generic way of constructing an MPC protocol is to compute a secret sharing for each value in the circuit. Since there are at most T corrupted parties, the adversary does not learn anything given the shares of corrupted parties. In this talk, we are particularly interested in the Shamir secret sharing scheme Say the dealer wants to secret share a value S, 
the data will first generate a random degree t polynomial f with f0 to be the secret s, since the s share is set to be fi. To reconstruct the secrets from any t plus one shares, we can first use the Lagrange interpolation to recover the polynomial f by using those t plus one shares. Then the secret is just f0. As for the secrecy, given any t shares, there is a single polynomial corresponding to each secret value s. To see this, we may set f0 to be the secret value s and then use the Lagrange interpolation with the given t shares and f0 to recover the polynomial f. It means that any t shares are independent of the secret value f0. In this talk, we will use square brackets of x with subscript t to represent a degree t Shamir sharing of the value x. It requires at least t plus one shares to reconstruct the secret and any t shares are independent of the secret value. We will use the following two properties of the Shamir secret sharing scheme. The first one is linear homomorphism, namely adding two degree t sharings x and y gives you a degree t sharing of the secret x plus y. This is because we add the underlying two polynomials together. So the degree remains the same and the secret becomes the summation of the original two secrets. The second property states that multiplying two degree t sharings gives you a degree two t sharing of the secret x times y. This is because we multiply the underlying two polynomials so the degree becomes two times t, and the secret is the product of the original two secrets. Now we are ready to see how communication efficient protocols are constructed. Here is an outline of this talk. We will first introduce the DM protocol, the best known communication efficient protocol with semi-honest security. Then we will discuss the security of the DM protocol against a fully malicious adversary and show how previous work achieved malicious security by using a verification protocol. Finally, we will introduce our efficient verification protocol with sublinear communication complexity. Using such a verification protocol, we can achieve malicious security with the same communication efficiency as the DM protocol. Any questions so far? Yes, what should I think of T? Uh, is it T, is T like half of N? Yes, uh, better to think, so uh, you can think that N is equal to two, two times T plus one. So T is strictly smaller than N by two. I see, so you assume a synchronous network with the broadcast channel? Uh, we do not assume there is the broadcast channel. Or just synchronous network, essentially, with yes. pairwise, pairwise, yes. uh, pairwise channel. Okay. Yes. So, so each pair of parties can safely communicate messages between them. So they do not need to broadcast messages to other parties. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Can you explain what do you mean when you say be independent of in some previous slides? Is it in the sense of some probability or something else? Uh, so independent means that uh, the distribution of those shares, uh, the distribution is independent of the value X. So no matter what the value X is, say the shares, the, so any T shares of a Shamir secret sharing are uniformly random. So it is independent of the secret value X. Is that clear? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so basically it means that even if you learn T shares, it does not learn anything about the secret value X. Okay. Okay. Um, so the, the best known communication efficient protocol in the semi on setting was introduced by Damgard and Nelson in 2007. At a high level, sorry, <laughs> recall that a semi honest adversary will always follow the protocol honestly but to try to learn extra information from the messages that corrupted parties received. 
Therefore, the main task is to maintain the secrecy of the intermediate values in the circuit. At a high level, the idea of the DM protocol is to compute a secret sharing for each where of the for each where value in the circuit. By the nature of the Shamir secret sharing scheme, the shares of, of, of corrupted parties are not, e are not enough to reconstruct the secrets and therefore are just several independent values. This ensures the secrecy of the protocol. To make this idea work, we need to handle the following four kinds of gates, input gates, modification gates, addition gates, and output gates. The first step is handling the input. We need to transform each input value to a secret sharing. For each input xi held by the party pi, the party pi will generate a random degree t sharing xi and then distribute the shares to other parties. Then we need to handle the modification gate, which is the core of the DM protocol. Given two input sharings x1 and x2, our goal is to compute a degree T sharing of the secret X1 times X2. The main observation here is that directly multiplying two degree T sharings gives you a degree, gives you a sharing of the correct value, but wrong degree. In particular, the degree of the resulting sharing becomes two times T. Therefore, the only thing we need to do is to reduce the degree of this sharing. To this end, we will let the first party P1 do the degree reduction. In the beginning, all parties hold two input sharings, X and, X and Y. They will locally multiply their shares so that all parties together hold a degree 2D sharing of the secret X times Y. Then the first party P1 collects the whole degree 2D sharing of Z, reconstructs the secret, and reshares the value Z using a degree T sharing. In this way, all parties will hold the degree T sharing of the modification result at the end. However, this approach reveals the modification result X times Y to the first party. Recall that we need to protect the secrecy of the intermediate values in the circuit. To fix it, we make some modifications. All parties first interactively prepare a pair of random sharings of the same random value R. One is a degree T sharing, and the other one is a degree 2T sharing. These two random sharings are referred to as double sharings. Such a pair of random double sharings can be efficiently prepared. For simplicity, here we choose to omit the details. At a high level, we will use the random value R to protect the secrecy of the modification result. Specifically, Instead of just multiplying their shares, all parties now compute a degree 2D sharing of Z, which is equal to X times Y plus R. Then as before, the first party P1 collects the whole degree 2D sharing of Z, reconstructs the secret, and reshares the value Z using a degree T sharing. Since R is a uniformly random value, the first party P1 does not learn anything about the modification result. Finally, to obtain a sharing of the correct value, all parties need to subtract the degree T sharing of R from the sharing distributed by P1. This completes the description of the DN modification protocol. Um, there is one question in the chat. So, uh, okay. Um, yeah. So don't we need to assume broadcast channel to get T less than half of them? Uh, so uh, a short answer is that uh, we don't need in our talk. Uh, so because in this talk, we are actually for allows the illusory to uh, abort the protocol at any time. So if we want to achieve the, um, we want to ensure the correct, ensure the success. Uh, so if we want the computation to be uh, finished at the end of, at the end, then we will need the broadcast channel. But here we allow the computation to be aborted during the computation. Yeah, 
Thanks. Okay. Then uh, continue uh, to the DM protocol. For an addition gate with input sharing X1 and X2, our goal is to compute a degree T sharing of the secret X1 plus X2. All parties locally compute the summation of their shares by the linear homomorphism of the Shamir secret sharing scheme. This will give us the correct sharing we want. Finally, to reconstruct the secret, all parties send the shares to the party who should receive this output. Then that party can reconstruct the secret by using those shares. In summary, the DM protocol consists of the following four phases. In the preparation phase, all parties interactively prepare enough double share rings for the modification gates. Then in the input phase, all parties transform their individual input to secret share rings. During the computation phase, addition case and modification case are evaluated in sequence. All parties compute a degree T sharing for each very value in the circuit. And finally, all parties reconstruct the output by using the share rings they hold. As for the communication complexity, the DM protocol needs to communicate four elements per party for each pair of random double share rings. During the modification protocol, each party needs to send one share to the first party and receives one share from the first party as well. Therefore, two elements in the DM modification protocol. In summary, the DM protocol needs to communicate six elements per party per gate. Any question about the DM protocol? I guess, except the first party that needs to receive more. Everyone yes. else. Yes, but in, uh, in practice, you can let different parties to do the job. So in average, each party will do the same amount of work. OK, now let's switch to a fully malicious adversary. Recall that a fully malicious adversary can arbitrarily deviate from the protocol by controlling the behaviors of corrupted parties. The deviation of the corrupted parties may not only lead the computation to a wrong result, but also break the secrecy of the underlying protocol. However, an interesting question is that, to what extent is the DM protocol secure against the fully malicious adversary? In 2014, Jenkins and others showed that the DM modification protocol is secure up to an additive attack in the presence of a fully malicious adversary. An additive attack means that the only thing that an adversary can do is changing the result by adding some constant D chosen by himself. For example, if the two input sharings of a modification gate are X and Y, then the output should be a degree T sharing of the secret X times Y. Under an additive attack, the adversary can choose a constant D and change the final result from X times Y to X times Y plus D. Formally, we can use an ideal functionality to model such an additive attack. The ideal functionality F mod, or the trusted third party, receives the two input sharings from all other parties. F mod reconstructs the two secrets X and Y and computes X times Y. Before sharing the modification result to our parties, FMOD also receives a constant D from the adversary and computes X times Y plus D. Finally, FMOD shares the value X times Y plus D to all parties. The theorem from GIP 14 states that the DN modification protocol securely computes this ideal functionality in the fully malicious setting. Note that the only thing that an adversary can do is changing the final result by adding some constant. In particular, during the interaction with the ideal functionality, the adversary does not learn anything about the secret values X and Y and the modification result X times Y. Before we move on, I would like to provide some insights on why the theorem holds. Let's go back to the DM modification protocol. For simplicity, we only 
consider the worst case where the first party P1 is corrupted. First, the use of a random degree 2D sharing R ensures that the degree 2D sharing of Z is also uniformly random. Therefore, when P1 collects the whole degree 2D sharing, P1 only learns a random sharing and nothing else. Second, the first party P1 can reconstruct the correct secret C. The only thing P1 can do is to reshare a different value, say Z prime. In particular, the difference D, which is equal to Z prime minus C, is also known to the first party P1. After sharing this value to all parties, the final result is a part from the correct value by a constant D. To achieve malicious security, to achieve malicious security, we need to protect the secrecy of the where values. We also need to ensure the correctness of the computation. Recall that addition gates are evaluated locally due to the linear homomorphism of the Shamir secret sharing scheme. The modification protocol is secure up to an additive attack. Therefore, the secrecy of the protocol comes for free. And the only thing we need to do is to check the correctness of the computation. In summary, a maliciously secure protocol can be achieved by first running the semi einstein protocol before reconstructing the output, then checking the correctness of the modifications, and finally reconstructing the output only if all the modifications are correctly computed. The new ingredient we need is an efficient verification protocol for the modifications. We will first introduce the batchwise modification verification introduced in BSF-012 and used in NV-18. Then we will introduce our efficient modification verification with sublinear communication complexity. Uh, Yifan, can, uh, can you just clarify why you don't have to check that the local computations were done correctly? Uh, yes, so, so it's actually a subtle question. So uh, a short answer is that we only need to ensure that the shares of honest parties are correct. So during the local competition, uh, if the input sharings held by the honest parties are correct, then after you say do the addition, the honest parties will still hold the correct sharing for the uh, output value. I see. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So I, I remember the DN07, like they need some computational assumption for the half case, right? You, you can get rid of that. Uh, yes, yeah, so that is not for the semi ons protocol. So the DN07, they actually have several constructions, including various uh, thresholds. So we only introduced the semi ons protocol here, which does not need any computational assumption. I see. So they have some robust version that needs the computational assumption with guarantee output. Yes. Okay, um, after using the DM protocol to compute the circuit for each modification gate, all parties hold three sharings, two for the input values and one for the output value. We refer to such a triple of sharings as a modification tuple. Given a batch of N modification tuples, our goal is to verify the correctness of those modification tuples. The high level idea of the batch wise modification verification technique is to construct three polynomials f, g, and h such that for the first m evaluation points, fi, gi, and hi corresponds to the ith modification tuple xi, yi, and zi. Furthermore, we want that if all the modification tuples are correct, then we should have h is equal to f times g. In this way, it is sufficient to only verify whether h is equal to f times g. For example, in this toy case, we have three tuples to verify. We can list the requirements for the polynomials in the table as follows. We first note that for polynomials f and g, they can be of degree m as one. 
we can use the Lagrange interpolation to determine these two polynomials by using x1 to xm and y1 to ym. If we want h to be f times g, then h should be a polynomial of degree 2 times m minus 1. However, we only have m evaluation points, which are insufficient to determine this polynomial. To solve it, we will compute additional m minus 1 modifications to provide enough points for the Lagrange interpolation. In this toy case, all what is m? Sorry, I'm confused about the letter m. M, right? Yeah, so yeah, M is, is the number of the multiplication tables we want to check. I see. Yes. So in this toy example, all parts will first compute four share rings for F and G at the evaluation points four and five. This step can be done locally because these four share rings are linear combinations of X1 to X3 and y1 to y3. Then all parties will use the DN multiplication protocol to interactively compute D4 and D5 as the evaluation points 4 and 5. Now we have enough points to determine the polynomial H. Note that FGH satisfies that F times G is equal to H if and only if all the multiplication tables are correct. That is, all parties behave honestly. Therefore, the task becomes to verify whether H is equal to F times G. To this end, it is sufficient to test a random evaluation point alpha. All parties together generate a random evaluation point alpha and compute three shear rings F alpha, G alpha, and H alpha. This step can also be done locally because these three shear rings are also linear combinations of the shear rings all parties hold. As for the communication complexity, we only need order of n multiplication operations to do this check. In essence, the fetch wise multiplication verification allows us to compress the check of the original n multiplication tuples into one check of a single multiplication tuple F alpha, G alpha, and H alpha. For the final tuple, it can also be efficiently verified. Here we choose to omit the details for simplicity. In summary, the construction in MV18 works as follows. All parties first run the semi einstein protocol until the output phase and compute a degree T sharing for each var value in the circuit. Then all parties use the batch-wise multiplication verification to check the correctness of the computation. Finally, if the verification passes, all parties proceed to reconstruct the output. As for the communication complexity, the construction ENV18 requires to compute two multiplication operations per gate, one for the evaluation and the other one for the verification. Recall that the DM protocol needs to communicate six elements per party per gate. Therefore, the construction in the 18 requires to communicate 12 elements per party per gate. Any question about this construction? Uh, there was a point when you were talking about the, the batchwise multiplication verification, where it seemed like you said that one of the steps involves doing a batchwise multiplication. Uh, sorry, can I repeat your question? It seemed like you said that to compute four and five, you have to do a, a multiplication. Yes. So if this process is supposed to be verifying the correctness of multiplications, how do you verify the accuracy? Oh, yes, it's a the... good point. So the point is that uh, even if D4 and D5 are not correctly, so if D4 and D5 are not correctly computed, then we must have H is not equal to F times G. So it means that if the adversary um, deviate from the protocol during the verification protocol, then we will not uh, have H equal to F times G, which means that all parties will know that the verification will fail. Okay, so there's no way that they can deviate that will cause the, yes. the final check to pass. Yes, because um, for the first three tuples, they are fixed. 
So they are based on the computation during uh, for the circuit. So the dossier can never change them out during the verification protocol. Okay, all right, thanks. To resolve this bottleneck, our idea is to use a verification protocol with sublinear communication complexity in the circuit size. Note that once we have such a verification protocol, we only need one multiplication operation per gate, since we no longer need one multiplication per, per gate for the verification step. This leads us to the final section of our talk, constructing an efficient verification with sublinear communication complexity. Can I ask you how large this batch needs to be for you to get the amortized costs? So actually you are checking all the multiplication tuples together. So it's like M is just the size of the circuit. So as long as M is greater than N, it's fine. Yes, so it's, it's just because if you want to check M multiplication tuples in this technique, then you will also need to compute M multiplication operations during the verification. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay. Our idea is inspired by two natural extensions. The first one is an extension of the DN multiplication protocol to compute an inner product operation given two input, share, input vectors of sharings X and Y of dimension K. We want to compute the degree T sharing of the inner product between X and Y. Specifically, an inner product between two vectors X and Y is the summation of Xi times Yi for all i. It has been shown that an inner product operation can be achieved with the same communication complexity as one multiplication operation which is independent of the dimension K. This extension has been observed and used in many previous works, for example, the work of CGH plus 18. To see how it works, let's first go back to the DN multiplication protocol again. The main observation here is that the DN protocol is used to do degree reduction. Recall that by the property of the Shamir secret sharing scheme, all parties can locally multiply their shares of X and Y to obtain a degree 2D sharing of the secret X times Y. In essence, the DN protocol is used to transform such a degree 2D sharing of X times Y to a degree T sharing of the same secret. To compute an inner product operation, the only change we need to make is to let all parties compute a degree 2D sharing of the inner product between X and Y. This step can be done locally because an inner product operation is just the summation of several multiplications. After we computing such a degree 2D sharing, all parties can use the DN protocol to do the degree reduction as before. In particular, the communication cost remains the same as that for one multiplication operation, which is independent of the dimension of the input vectors. The second extension, the second one is an extension of the batch wise multiplication verification to check the correctness of a batch of inner product tuples of the same dimension. This extension is first noted in the work NV18. The idea is basically the same as that for the verification for the multiplications, except that now all parties need to compute, need to use the inner product operations instead of the multiplication operations. In particular, in this toy example, all parties now need to compute D4 and D5 using the inner product uh, protocols. However, recall that the DM protocol allows us to compute an inner product operation with the same communication efficiency as the S1 multiplication operation. Therefore, the communication complexity of this extension is the same as that for the verification of multiplication tuples, that is, out of M multiplication operations. In essence, this technique allows us to reduce the check of M inner product tuples 
into one check of a single inner product tuple, F alpha, G alpha, and H alpha. Come back to our idea. Given a batch of M modification tuples, again, the goal is to check the correctness of these modification tuples. Our idea is to first transform this M modification tuples into a single inner product tuple of dimension M. Furthermore, we want that if any modification tuple is incorrect, then the resulting inner product tuple should also be incorrect. In this way, it is sufficient to only verify the single inner product tuple. To obtain such a single inner product tuple, a straightforward way is to set the first vector x to be x1, x2 to xm, the second vector y to be y1 to ym, and z to be the summation of zm. However, this is not sufficient because an explicit attack may work as follows. The adversary can cause z1 to be x1 times y1 plus one, and z2 to be x2 times y2 minus one. Then the first two multiplication tuples are incorrect, but the resulting inner product tuple is correct. This is because the errors in the original multiplication tuples are canceled in the resulting inner product tuple. To avoid such an attack, consider the following two polynomials f and g, where the coefficients of f are xi times yi, and the coefficients of g are zi. Then verifying the original multiplication tuples is equivalent to verifying whether f is equal to g. This can be done by testing a random evaluation point alpha. Therefore, we may set three share rings in the following form. The first vector x remains the same. For the second vector y, we multiply the s power of alpha to the s entry of y. Then z is said to be the summation of zi times the s power of alpha. We can verify that the inner product between the first two vectors x and y is f alpha and z is equal to g alpha. In this way, it is sufficient to only verify the single inner product tuple. However, we note that the resulting inner product tuple has dimension m, where m is the number of multiplication phase. If we directly check the correctness of this tuple by reconstructing all the shear rings, then even checking a single inner product tuple would cost us proportional to m. Our idea of the second step is to first reduce the dimension of this inner product tuple by a factor of k, where k is the parameter. With the careful combination of the two extensions, we will show that the communication complexity of the second step only depends on k, and in particular, is independent of m, the dimension of, uh, the, dimension of the inner product tuple. This allows us to repeat this step enough number of times until the final dimension is reduced to one. That is, the final tuple becomes the multiplication tuple. We will need to repeat the second step log km times until the final tuple becomes the multiplication. However, the communication, of, the communication cost of each time is independent of the dimension m. Therefore, the overall, the overall communication complexity only depends on log km, which is sublinear in the circuit size. Now let's see how to reduce the dimension of this inner product tuple by a factor of k. All parties first separate each of the two input vectors into k small sub vectors of the same dimension. Specifically, for the first vector x, the vector x1 contains the first m over k entries in x, then x2 contains the second m over k entries, and so on. We will do the same thing to the second vector y. Then for each pair of xi and yi, all parties use the dn inner product protocol to compute the inner product result between xi and yi. For the final pair, instead of using the dn protocol, 
we simply set the k to be z minus the, sum, the summation of the first k minus one result. In this way, if the input inner product tuple is incorrect, then at least one of the new inner product tuples is also incorrect. Therefore, it is sufficient to only verify this k new inner product tuples. Note that we need to compute out of k inner product tuples at this step. To verify this k inner product tuples, all parties will apply the batchwise inner product verification to compress the check of this k inner product tuples into one check of a single inner product tuple. In particular, the dimension of the resulting tuple becomes m over k. Recall that the communication complexity of the batchwise inner product verification is out of k inner product operations. Therefore, the OR communication complexity of the second step is order of k inner product operations. Thanks to the DM protocol, it is equivalent to order of k multiplication operations. In the third step, we simply repeat step two until the final dimension becomes one. The final multiplication table can also be checked efficiently. Here we omit the details for simplicity. As for efficiency, in step three, we need to repeat log km times of the second step. Since each time requires to compute out of k multiplication operations, the overall communication complexity of our efficient verification protocol is out of k times log km multiplication operations, which is sublinear in the circuit side. In practice, we can adjust the parameter k to achieve a better performance in general, increasing k will reduce the number of iterations during the verification protocol. For example, if k is equal to the square root of m, then we only need two iterations during the verification. On the other hand, decreasing k will benefit both the communication complexity and the computation complexity. Therefore, we can adjust the parameter k based on the network latency. Here is a summary of our idea. In the beginning, all parties hold M multiplication tuples to verify. The first step is transforming this M multiplication tuples into one single inner product tuple of dimension M. To verify this single inner product tuple, all parties first separate each of the two input vectors into K small sub vectors of the same dimension. For each pair of xi and yi, all parties use the dn inner product protocol to compute the inner product result of xi and yi. Then all parties use the batchwise inner product verification to compress the check of this k inner product tuples into one check of a single inner product tuple. In particular, the dimension of the resulting inner product tuple is reduced by a factor of k. Now we, are now we can repeat the process until the final dimension becomes one. As a result, our efficient verification protocol achieves sublinear communication complexity in the circuit side. A follow-up work has implemented our results and compared with the previously best known implementation results, the work by Cheetah and others in crypto 2018. The experiments use arithmetic circuits with one million multiplication gates in the line setting. The finite field is the 61-bit Marsden field. All the numbers are reported running times in milliseconds. In the experiments, we choose two different kinds of gates, uh, sorry, two different kinds of circuits. One kind has steps 20 and the other one has steps 1,000. Different columns correspond to different number of parties participating in the computation. As we can see, when the circuit depth is 20, our protocol is about 1.7 times faster than the work of CGH plus 18. When the circuit depth is about is 1,000, our protocol is about 1.6 times faster. The, the experiment results show that 
our construction is also efficient in practice. As a summary of this talk, we first introduced the DM protocol, the best known communication efficient protocol in the semi-only setting. The whole idea of the DM protocol is to compute a degree T ship Shamir sharing for each where value in the circuit. The core of the DM protocol is its multiplication protocol, which utilizes the property that multiplying two degree T sharings gives you a degree two T sharing of the correct multiplication result. In essence, the DM protocol is used to reduce the degree of this sharing by transforming such a degree two T sharing of X times Y to a degree T sharing of the same secret. Then we discuss the security of the DM protocol, which is secure up to an additive attack. With security up to an additive attack, we show that malicious security can be achieved by combining the semi ons DM protocol with a verification protocol for the multiplication gates. Finally, we introduce our efficient verification protocol. We make use of two natural extensions for, for the inner product operations, one to compute an inner product operation, and the other one to verify a batch of inner product tuples. Our idea recursively uses this to Sorry, our, our, we, we carefully combine these two extensions and use them recursively. As a result, our efficient verification protocol achieves sublinear communication complexity in the circuit side. Using such a verification protocol, we can achieve malicious security with the same communication efficiency as the DM protocol. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. I guess I didn't quite follow how you can do better than the original semi honest one. The semi honest one was like six, but you are 5.5. Yes, actually, I didn't mention that in the talk. But yes, I can uh, briefly explain how it works. It actually follows from a very cute observation. Uh, let's first go back to the multiplication protocol. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, this page, for example. So the observation is that we know that this degree T sharing of T distributed by the first party P1 does not need to be a random one because P1 knows all the shares. So we, no long, we do not need to protect, protect the secrecy of the value Z. So instead of using a random degree T sharing, the first party P1 can predetermine, say, a set of T parties and set the shares of those parties to be zero. And then P1 can reconstruct the whole sharing by using those shares of zero and the secret Z. So in this way, it means that the first party P1 only needs to send the non-zero value to the other parties. So we only need to send actually 0 0.5 elements per party uh, when P1 distributes the shares. Uh, is that, yeah, that that makes sense. Any other questions? Um, hey, Ivan, so you mentioned follow-up work. So what do you guys do there? Oh, it's, uh... it was during the exper exper uh, experiments uh, slide, I think. Yeah, sorry, what's your question again? So what is the follow-up work about? Oh, yeah. So actually, this follow-up work uh, makes some further improvement of the DM protocol. So, it's, so this is not in, this is independent of the verification protocol, but try to improve the semi ons DM protocol. OK, I see. Yeah, so uh, we reduce the communication cost actually from 5.5 elements to four elements. Uh, and so we, we ran some ex experiments to show that reducing the communication uh, 
do means that we need a uh, shorter time to run the circuit. Um, I have one more question. So, um, so what uh, if the verification fail? Let's say if a verification of a multiplication gate fails, then they, yeah. uh, all the party just restart the computation. Oh, so uh, actually, uh, so we are actually focusing on a weak uh, security model. So we allow the computation to be aborted. I see. Yes. So, so if you want to achieve a stronger notion, say, oh. ensure the correct, ensure the success of the computation, we actually have a uh, so we actually have the same uh, have the construction in the same paper. So you can see how we compel uh, our efficient protocol into a, a guaranteed out theory one. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And for the robust one, like with guarantee output, it's also information is theoretically secure. Yes, but then we need the broadcast channel. Uh -huh, I see. Okay, so if there are no other questions, let's thank Ethan again. That's a really good talk. <laughs>